Good morning, everybody. Let's uh, take a moment just to pray, and then we will get started. Uh, may I request somebody to please pray with the class, and we will get started. Somebody could pray. Shall I pray, Pastor? Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, we come to your awesome presence this morning. Thank you, Lord, that your mercies are new every morning. Mm. Thank you, Lord, that you have good plans and purposes for us, Father. And as you're leading us to walk in those plans and purposes, Father, whatever we are learning from your powerful word, your timeless truth, Father, lead us into that, Father. Lead us to walk in holiness in the purposes that you have and let them be fulfilled in the name of Jesus, Father. Bless everyone. Bless everyone who is here, Father. Let your powerful spirit lead us, Father, and lead us into paths of righteousness for your name's sake, Father. Thank you, and we give you glory, honor, and praise for who you are, Father. We give you all the thanks that you are with us, Father, day after day, and that you're leading us, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Once again, we give you glory, honor, and praise, and ask you to fill us with your wisdom, so that we are able to understand what we are receiving, Father, and be able to walk in it and be built up in Christ's likeness in days to come to glorify you in every way and walk, Father, that we choose, Father. Let all things be done in your name, Father. Continue to lead us, bless pastor, bless all the students, and Lord, let your powerful presence be with us as we are learning. We give you glory, honor, and praise, and ask this prayer in the precious and matchless name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Amen and amen. 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 Thank you. And good morning. Welcome, everybody, uh, to um, this course on holiness, BC209. Um, today, we are going to get into our third section of this course. Um, so, in the first section, we focused on the theme of holiness, the holiness of God. Uh, where we try to, in some way, to whatever extent we could, uh, get an understanding or a comprehension of the holiness of God, that attribute of who he is, and how that undergirds every other aspect of his nature. We also saw that God desires that holiness to be reproduced in us so that we can be a holy people, uh, set apart for him. And even in this life, as we live in a, you know, in a, in a world that's filled with sin and wickedness and ungodliness, yet God wants us to be holy. And we said that he enables us to be holy. So it's not just he gives us a call and says, try and figure it out yourself. But he calls us to be holy, and then he enables us to be holy. In section two, a short section that we did, uh, we focused on uh, repentance, recovery, and restoration, saying that one of the things that we need to keep in our lives on an ongoing basis is repentance. That means uh, if, if, if I'm out of alignment with God, his ways and his thoughts, if I'm out of alignment, I need to repent. I need to change my thinking and my acting, my behavior. So that's repentance. So that, that we could stay in line with the nature, the character, the purpose, and the will of God. And repentance brings us into this recovery and restoration. Okay? And uh, we also said that Sometimes um, uh, this whole repentance is a, is a small thing. You know, we, we go off track a little bit and we just get back in line very easily. In some cases, it can be a long wandering that people just wander away uh, from the course that God has for their lives. And then uh, that could be uh, pretty serious. And then there is a long journey of recovery and restoration. But it is possible and we need to make it so that we get back into line with God's will. 
Now we're going to go into the third section, which is the practical side of how to live a holy life. Uh, one of the things, that, and, 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 I, and I have mentioned this uh, before, but one of the things that really uh, sparked this course and uh, 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 you know, kind of motivated putting this course together was um, in a in a in a leaders conference. We were doing a leaders conference, part of that, and then uh, I did a session on. Uh, um, I forget the exact topic of that session. It had to do something with overcoming and so on. Uh, I forget the exact title, but so after I did the session, we had question answers, a time for question answers. And this was you know, leaders, people who are pastoring churches and those who are working with the pastors in, in leading the congregation or serving the congregation. And one of them asked the question, you know, how do I'm facing temptation? How do I overcome temptation? So I was actually shocked because, uh, you know, these are leaders who are leading the congregations. These are not new believers who are learning how to overcome temptation. Uh, but these are pastors and leaders who are taking care of their churches. But uh, this was a very basic question, you know, and that's when I felt suddenly I thought, oh, we better make sure that the leaders we are training <laughs> know how to overcome, know how to live a holy life and know how to overcome temptation. It's very, you know, it's a very basic thing. We must all know, uh, you know, uh, how, what God has given to us in his word uh, to overcome temptation, to overcome uh, the flesh, the world and the devil. Uh, it's something that we should, re we should know. It's like, a, um, you know, a warfare tactic, a warfare, you know, you should know how to engage. Uh, in, over, in, in warring against, overcoming or fighting against the flesh, the world, and the devil. And uh, it should be very clear. And we should, because it's, it's a lifelong thing, right? Throughout our journey as Christians, as believers, we are going to fight against the flesh, the world, and the devil. And these are the three things that actually pull us and keep us away from living in holiness, the way God wants us to live, right? So uh, it should be something, you know, well established in our hearts and minds that, hey, I know, I know how I'm supposed to overcome the flesh, the world, and the devil. Uh, I know the strategies. I know the equipment, the, the equipping that God has given to me as a believer. I know what I must use, the weapons of my warfare, and I know how to keep uh, the flesh, the world, and the devil in subjection so that we can walk in holiness. Now, uh, of course, uh, we must practice this, right? If we fail to practice it, then that's where we deviate, we go away from uh, the way God wants us to work, and then we have to repent and get back in line and continue our journey. So anyway, so that, you know, in that conference, as I was, you know, having this interaction with the leaders, that's kind of what sparked this whole thing. And so we put this course together and wanted to make sure that part of the course we spent talking about how to overcome. Now, some of the things that we're going to go through in this section, overcoming the flesh, the world, the devil, uh, or I, I would say everything in, in this section is basic, meaning it's not something you've not heard before. Uh, it's probably something you have heard before, but I want it to be very, I want it to become very clear in our hearts and minds. And I want it to be so established so that we can live by it, practice it, and live victoriously, consistently, uh, not up and down, up and down, up and down, no, but consistently. You're walking victorious. You're overcoming the flesh, the world, the devil. Right. So that's the objective of the section because this is key. If we do this, we will walk in holiness the way God wants us to walk, all right? So it's basic, but it's very, very 
uh, important. So let's get into that. I've um, shared the PDF um, okay, um, on the coursework section and I'm gonna share the screen. All right, so overcoming, living victorious over the flesh, the world, the devil. Uh, well, so what we're gonna do, let's just back up here. So talk about the fact that we can, God has called us to an overcoming life. And uh, the two important things is we must understand the cross and understand our identity. Now, both these things you have looked at in depth in different courses. So we're just making mention of it here. We must know how to use the word uh, to dominate. So the two weapons, two main things, the word of God and walking in the spirit. So these two things must be very clear. How do you use the word of God? and how to walk in the spirit so that we can overcome the flesh, the world, the devil, right? So then we go into the specific areas, the three areas, so that we understand, you know, how does the flesh, that means the desires, the wrong desires in our body, how they work on us, trying to pull us down. How would the work world, that means the influences around us, work at us to pull us down? And then of course, you know, what are the strategies the devil uses to pull us down? Now, these are things we are familiar with, but it's good to be, you know, to go through it, to be very clear. Ultimately, our goal is to live the overcoming life so that we can, you know, walk in holiness as we journey through life. It's not easy. We are living in a world uh, where sin is so prevalent and we're just taken for granted. But as believers or living the overcoming life, is uh, is what we are called to and what we are striving for. So let's uh, get into this. The overcoming life, we must, all of us must understand, be very clear in our hearts and minds that God has already designed us to be overcomers. Therefore, living the overcoming life is a possibility. And that's our mindset. You know, we must not have the mindset that, oh man, I am a sinner. I am going to keep sinning. And thank God, uh, you know, uh, Jesus paid for all my sins. And of course, um, his blood will cleanse me. And uh, we must not have that kind of a mindset. The mindset is, God has called me to be an overcomer. I am going to overcome every evil, every sin, every wickedness in this world. But if I do fall, if I do make a mistake, I thank God, the price has already been paid. The blood will cleanse me and the Lord will put me back on my feet to live this overcoming life, right? So it's a different mindset. Now, this is based on scripture, First John, Five, one and four says that uh, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So you are born of God. God gave birth to you. You have the life and the nature of God. And what about those of us who are born of God? Verse four says, for whatever or whoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So surely the Bible says, Everyone who is born of God is an overcomer. You overcome the world. Now, when you look at the usage of the word world by John in his epistles, uh, or in the gospel and in the epistles, John, the world, uh, represents, he's, he's referring to the whole system of evil and rebellion in which we are. So, you know, you remember the gospel of John, he would say, you know, John 17, they are in the world, but they're not of the world. I'm sending them into the world, but you protect them, right? So what is the world? It's this, this, this environment around us, which is actually evil and in rebellion against God. John also writes in his epistle, you know, the same chapter, chapter five, 
uh, later on, I think it's verse 18 or 19, he says, the whole world lies in the lap of the wicked one. So that's the world that he's referring to, this, this whole system of evil, wickedness, sin, corruption, moral decay that we are living in. We are living in that. But we are overcomers. You know, we are not going to be influenced by the world. We are not going to be dominated by the world. We are overcomers. And of course, he tells us very clearly, this is how we have the victory. It's through our faith in God. Right? So, and this is true for every child, every child of God, right? It's not just for uh, for those who are, you know, in full-time ministry. It's not every child of God. You can be a professional. You can be anything, you know, what your vocation is in life. But every child of God can defeat the world. And our faith is what gives us the victory. Right? So that must be very clear. You know, we start from that. I am an overcomer. I can overcome. So if there is any besetting sin, if there is any sinful habit, and any sinful pattern that's taken a hold of us in our lives, uh, if suddenly we are faced with uh, evil influences around us, our posture is, I am born of God. I'm an overcomer. I'm going to gain victory over this. I'm going to conquer this. I'm going to have mastery over this because that's who I am. I'm born of God. Now, our salvation includes abundant life, right? So Jesus said, I've come that you may have life. Now that word life, is uh, he, he's using a very special word. He's using the word zoe, which is a word that is uh, uh, used uh, very exclusively to reference the God kind of life. Uh, you know, so Jesus is saying, I've come to give you life, the God kind of life, the Zoe life. Uh, it's the very life that God has in himself. So we all have the natural physical life, which is by us. Uh, we have a way of life, which is a different Greek word, anastrophe. But then, then when the Bible talks about eternal life, it uses this unique word, Zoe, just referring to the life that God has in himself. That's the life is given to us. Right? And John, in the episode, 1 John 5, 11 and 12, he says, God has given to us this eternal life. So it's usually the word Zoe is prefixed with this. Usually it's prefixed with this eternal life. Not always. But this Zoe is in Christ. And he who has the Son has this Zoe. So we have the life of God. So if we have the life of God, then this life is going to drive darkness out of us. Right? So... John, again, back in his in the gospel, he says, in him was life. The life, this Zoe, was the light of men. That means wherever this Zoe entered in, or whoever, whom, whomever the Zoe went into, it filled that person with light. It's the light of men. So he explains, what does that mean? It means the light shines in darkness. Light dispels this, drives out this darkness, and the darkness cannot withstand it. So, if you and I have received this abundant life, it's like the light of God has flooded our being, and the life of God so influences us, so works in us, Zoe, life of God works in us to dispel darkness out of us. And the darkness cannot do anything about it. It cannot overcome it. It cannot withstand it. So our salvation includes abundant life, Zoe, the life of God. And the life of God fills us, so influences us to dispel darkness out of us. Right? And uh, uh, it touches every part of our being, spirit, soul, and body. For example, the Apostle Paul said that the Zoe life of God was 
manifest or made visible in his body, people could see that his body was touched by the life of God, the Zoe life of God. Now we are we are speaking right now in this in this section on dealing with sin. So definitely, the Zoe life of God will dispel sin and its hold, its grip, and its influence over us. Anything that has to do with darkness, sin of course is darkness. So this life shines in darkness and dispels it out of our lives. So what we're doing in this simple chapter is we're establishing the fact that every believer, every child of God has the capacity to live victorious over sin. First, God has said we are overcomers. Next, we see that we have the life of God and which drives darkness out of us. So if we have the eternal life, we don't have to sit around in bondage to sin because sin is of darkness. And our salvation includes a life of victory here and now in this present life. Now, many times we talk about victory as something in the sweet by and by. You know, okay, when I get to heaven, everything will be fine. I will have complete victory, uh, all of that. And, and yeah, of course, when we get to heaven, when we leave this world, there are no more battles to fight with sin and no more struggle with Satan. Uh, no more struggle with the worldly influences, uh, no more struggle with our own flesh, of course, true. And so in one sense, yeah, we are free from the battles of life, victory. But we must also understand that there is victory given to us in the midst of battles, in the midst of warfare, in the midst of wickedness and sin that's in this world in this life. So our salvation includes that. For example, we see in Romans 5.17 that uh, we who have received abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, we will reign in life through Jesus Christ. We will reign. To reign means to rule in life. So he's talking about this life in life because right now we have received abundance of grace god's grace we received the gift of righteousness and we will reign in this life through jesus christ that means i will have mastery dominion over everything that i face in this life it doesn't it doesn't mean that i will not face things difficulties in this life we will face it we will face sin and we will face sickness and we will face all the things that are around us because we are in this world. But we can reign over them through Jesus Christ. We can overcome them. We can rule over them, so to speak. And in every situation, God leads us in triumph in Christ. So that must be our mindset. Look. I know there are battles, I know there are challenges, there are temptations, etc. But God leads us in triumph. And therefore, victory over sin, victory over temptation is part of the salvation God has given to us. And lastly, in this chapter, we say, look, Jesus is our model. Jesus is our model. We are going to imitate him. We're going to try to be more and more like him. And Jesus walked in absolute mastery over the flesh, the world, and the devil. Jesus walked in absolute mastery over the flesh, the world, the devil. Now, somebody will say immediately, but well, that was the Son of God. That was God who became man. Obviously, 
sin cannot touch him. But we must not forget that Jesus was truly God, but he was fully human. He was fully human. He became man, meaning he took on human form, body like you and me. And the Bible tells us very clearly, he was tempted in all points. He faced the pressures of sin, the temptations he faced. So he didn't walk on earth as uh, just deity where he couldn't feel the, 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 the wickedness around. No. He walked on the earth in humanity so that he felt temptation in all points. And yet he was without sin. Years without sin. Satan came to him on many occasions. Now we we know you know the the, the, the three temptations at the very beginning of his ministry um, that is recorded for us. That doesn't mean Satan never tempted him before that or after that. Hmm. He was tempted in all points. We did. So, so those are three recorded temptations uh, in the wilderness. But surely he was tempted before that, he was tempted after that. But every time Satan came, whichever point he was attacking, Jesus could say this, that the devil has no nothing in me. There's nothing in me. John 14, 30. And I said, look, the rule of the world is coming, but he has nothing in me. I mean, there's not even a small foothold he has gained in me. He has nothing in me. And Jesus is of a model as sons and daughters of God. So he became the son of God. The eternal became the son of God, walked in humanity, to show us, not only to make us sons and daughters of God, which he did, but he also showed us how we can live as sons and daughters of God. Now, I, I realize that for some of us, this may be a stretch. You say, what do you mean? You're making us equal with Jesus. I'm not making us equal with Jesus. He's always God. But what I'm saying is, he modeled in his humanity the life that sons and daughters of God are called to live. I'm talking about his humanity. I'm talking about the life he lived in, in his humanity. And saying that that's the model he gave for us as sons and daughters of God to live that life. And the Bible makes it very clear. First John chapter two, verse six says, he who says, he abides in him. That is, if you are in Christ, he says, you ought to walk as he walked. Walk just as he walked. So the Bible is saying it. The Bible says, if you are in Christ, you're a believer, you're in Christ, you're living in Christ, well, then the Bible says you've got to walk as he walked. What does that mean? Every aspect of his life his humanity, including overcoming sin, uh, overcoming things in this world, walk as he walked. He's our model, he's our standard, and that's how we must perceive ourselves walking. So, uh, we need a change of mindset. Instead so of saying, oh, I'm such a filthy sinner, I'm going to be a sinner all my life. Oh God, I'm a wiggly worm. You know, stop talking like that. And wake up to what God has made you to be and what God has called you to be. He's called you and me to walk as Jesus walked. 
And if he called us to do that, then it's a possibility, not something we cannot attain to. Otherwise, you know, it would be uh, uh, really, uh, uh, I use the word foolishness, it would be foolishness to say that we are called to do that. But because we are called to walk as he walked, that is a possibility. And we should keep our hearts and minds, okay, I'm going to walk like that. And John says, you know, of course, in, 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 in 1 John chapter 4, the, the, the focus, the main, main, uh, the main uh, uh, focus is on, on walking in love. Uh, but as he's talking about love and the love of God and walking in the love of God, he says, you know, uh, the love of God is perfected among us. That means we are people who live by the love of God and we walk in the love of God. And that's the thing that really dominates us. And therefore, uh, we have boldness on the day of judgment. That means we are not afraid of judgment day. Now, we are people who walk in love. We are people who experience the love of God. We know that God is love and that we are walking in love. And so, you know, we're not even afraid. We're not afraid of the day of judgment. And then in that context, all while he's saying all that, he also says this. He says, because as he is, so are we in this world. It's a very small statement, it's very, but it's very profound. It's very deep. What is he saying? You know, we're walking in love. We've experienced God as love. We love him because he first loved us. And therefore, we love the brethren. And love is perfected among us. And therefore, you know, we're not afraid of Judgment Day because as he is, so are we in this world. And if you look at various um, other versions of the English Bible and how, it, how they render it, of that, not that little phrase there, it's like this, you know, our life in this world is the same as Christ. Or the English Revised Version, uh, sorry, the easy to read version, the easy to read version says, in this world, we are like Jesus. The Message Bible says, our standing in this world is identical with Christ. The Passion Translation says, all that Jesus now is, so are we in this world. All that he is, we are in this world. You know, think about that. That's, 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 Bake a life in this world is the same as Christ. That means we are living in this world the way Jesus would walk through it. So would Jesus be walking through this world as a poor sinner, as somebody who's dominated by all the things in this world? Would he do that? No. He would walk saying, the prince of the ruler of this world, I mean, Satan comes, but he has no place in me. You know, he would walk in that place as, as a conqueror, as a victor, as somebody's, you know, he said, I have overcome this world. And we are in this world as he is. He's a world overcomer, we are world overcomers. That's how we walk, All right? So, all this translates to reality as we do this through faith. That means we've got to put our faith to work in overcoming the world in as much as we put our faith to work, you know, for other things, right? So put our faith to work to live victoriously over the flesh, the world, and the devil. Put our faith to work. You and I can live a victorious overcoming life in Christ. And that's the point of this first introduction chapter. We can live, that should be our mindset, I can overcome. You know, uh, when you think of it, what are believe, what do believers struggle with? Okay, there could be some obvious sins, or there could be other things like, you know, having a bad temper and uh, you know, just, uh, uh, or, or, you know, speaking untruths, speaking falsehood, or uh, being covetous about money, or covetous about uh, fame and power and position, and, 
you know, these may not these may not seem bad, like you know, committing adultery or murder or whatever, but these are still sins of the heart. You know, they they may not be sins of commission in the sense of doing something, but it's the attitudes that are wrong, hard attitudes that are wrong still. So whatever it is, whether it's the sins of our heart, of our attitudes, or the sins that are expressed in behavior, we can live victorious over coming lives. It's possible. Our life in this world is to be the same as Christ. So that's our goal, to discover from the Word of God what has God given to us to live like this. Because if he called us to live like this, he would also have equipped us to do that. And we would need to find out what is the equipping he's given to us in his word. And then let's learn to use it so that we overcome the flesh, the world, and the devil. I want to pause here for a couple of minutes and see if there are any questions. Um, and uh, we will take this up. Okay, um, I see a question there. Anita says, uh, we love him because he loved us first. Please explain this. Um, so, we love him because he first loved us. All right. May I open it out to the class? Anybody would like to explain this? Uh, Anita's question is, please explain. We love yeah. him. He loved us. Who wants to do it? Can I explain, sir? Please Pastor. go. Please go ahead, Tesh. I believe that in Genesis 1, starting from there, we were created in the image and likeness of God. And God is love. And it, it says we, he loved us. What was it? It says um, because. We love oh, him because he first loved us. Yeah. yeah. We love him because he first loved us. God is love. He's the epitome of love. And he wants pretty much the, um, the best for us. And he see that we were going on an ungodly part and we were a part of him. So he loves us. Just like a parent, using an example, a mother has a child. The child is from her. So she loves that child. Regardless mm -hmm. if the child is bad and you have to discipline the child, you love the child just the same. Mm -hmm. But you, you, the child is a part of you, come from you. And you continuously want that child to come to be good, come and be something of the, him or herself. So just the same, we are a part of Christ. Christ loves us because when he looks at us, as says little children, you know, we, he loves us. He looks at us as we are his, his image bearer. That's what we should be. So when we're going on a dark part, right, that um, we were sinners falling, he calls us back to his love, calls us back to his grace and his forgiveness. So everything that he does is out. He corrects us out of love. So mm. everything that he does is surrounded by love. Mm. So that's Thank my you. explanation. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Dasha. Anybody wants to add some more thoughts to this? Um, we, so what we're discussing is, uh, the Bible says, we love him because he first loved us. Um, what does it mean? You know, what are your what are your thoughts on it? And anybody else, feel free to share, please. Um, I see Chaya's comment. Uh, Even though we are sinners, he loved us unconditionally. There we are, Romans five eight. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Anybody else? Thank you for sharing. Anybody else? Okay. All right, so, yeah, um, so but what happens really is like like uh, what has been shared. Um, God loves us so much, even though we were sinners, he still loved us. And then when we experience that love, what happens? We reciprocate that love. Yeah, our hearts are opened to love God back. But who did the loving first? 
he loved us, right? When we were enemies, he still loved us. While we were still sinners, he loved us. While we were wavered, he still kept loving us. And then at some point, we perceive that love. I mean, we experience that love, we encounter that love. And that evoked a response of love from us. So that's what John is saying, right? We love him because he first loved us. So it is not, you know, John says, not that we loved God, but that God loved us, right? And then we love him back because of the experience of his love, right? Right, so Rose writes, um, God draws us to love him. He initiates the love to be produced in us, right? So God does that work and then we love him in return. Good, good. Any questions on this introduction chapter? Any thoughts? Any questions? Okay. So I'm um, assuming all of all of you are with me so far. And uh, so what we've established in this simple chapter is we need to think of ourselves as overcomers. In a world where there is darkness around us, and God has given to us everything we need to live this overcoming life. Overcoming, I'm talking about specifically, we are talking about the flesh, the world, and the devil the three things that pull us down and keep us from holiness. Right now, the basis. So the, so the basis for us, and again, this is familiar ground, but let's just uh, uh, look at it. Go to share the PDF. So there are two important things that form the basis for living an overcoming life, victorious life, right? And this is something... Uh, you have already seen in separate courses, but I'm just putting it here so that there's context. First is the cross of Jesus Christ. That means what did Jesus do for us on the cross? Right? Secondly, our identity in Christ. So these are two very important things that we must be absolutely established in. Right? Because this, these two, the cross of Jesus, what Jesus did for us on the cross, and who we are in Christ today, this formed the basis for every believer, every child of God, to live a victorious life. So, to live an overcoming life, it's not about how much willpower you have. It's not about or how much self-control you have. It's not about, you know, how godly influence you have in your life. It's not about, are you in a very good environment that keeps you away from sin? I mean, are you living in a monastery? <laughs> you know, those kinds of things. No. The basis for living and overcoming life for every Christian, for every believer is what Jesus did for us on the cross and who we are in Christ today. So none of us have any excuse. You know, we can't say, well, you don't know the people I have to live amongst, you know, um, such ungodly people, uh, or, you know, you don't know my upbringing. You know, I had such bad influence when I was being brought up. Uh, yeah, yeah. So none of us can use those things as excuses. I'm not saying those things are there. Of course, we are all living in a world that is evil. But the basis for which to live an overcoming life for all of us is the same. We must all depend on what Jesus did for us on the cross. And we must all depend on who we are in Christ today. Right? So these are two things you know we have studied in detail uh, in the, uh, uh, other courses. But I want to just you know, quickly review what we mean by that. So first is, on the cross, the power of sin was broken. Right? 
So there are many things that Jesus did for us on the cross. You know, uh, he paid for our sin. He took our sicknesses and diseases. Um, he conquered Satan. He removed the curse so that the blessing could come upon us. He established a new covenant for us through the cross and so on. You know, there's many, there are many, many things that we could say. And in all of that, one very important thing that Jesus did on the cross is that he broke the power of sin. That means he destroyed sin's control over our life. You know, we must receive a revelation of that. That means we must understand the truth. The power of sin over my life has been broken on the cross. So not only did Jesus pay for my sin, but he broke the power of sin. Right? So, uh, and this is well established from Romans chapter 6. And uh, we have studied this uh, in the past. It says here, you know, the old man was crucified. Talking about the old sinful nature. Uh, the, you know, people may call it the Adamic nature or the satanic nature or whatever. But this, that old person inside was crucified, was put to death. So that the body of sin, which is the power of sin, might be done away with. And we should no longer be slaves of sin. So, you, uh, you know, it should be very clear in your heart. You are no longer a slave of sin. No longer a slave of anything. You know, if you say, you know, a bad temper, addiction to this or addiction to that. No, no, no. You're not a slave to anything. You're not a slave to anything. You have been freed from sin. You know, so Paul, Paul the Apostle Paul saying, look, if you've, we've died, so you're free from sin. And therefore in that same chapter, he says, sin will not have dominion over you. So we must be absolutely convinced that the sin will not have dominion over you. Now here is the problem. The problem is, and I'm talking about even Christian ministers, Instead of acknowledging this truth, which is written in the scriptures, they accommodate sin. You know, um, and I'm just making mention of this because you know I, I, we need to understand how deceptive things could be. Now think about Rabbi Zacharias. Right, he was such a great, well-known. Christian leader, apologist, and so on. And uh, he, he's, 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 you know, he had a ministry that spanned many decades and uh, so highly respected, etc. On one side, he portrayed an image of absolute integrity. So people, you know, looked at him as here's somebody who was living a life of integrity. But in his private life, which all of this came out afterwards, was he was excusing himself in sin. And from the accounts that were given from various people and then the reports that were put out by Reverend Zacharias Ministries themselves, his, his persuasion of people uh, of uh, you know of all the women that he sinned with, his this reasoning was, you know, this is a reward God is giving me for the sacrifice I am making for the ministry. Now, how deceived, how deceiving that kind of thinking is. You know, so here you have somebody who was was a Christian apologist, and yet so deceived, so wrong in his own logic. The logic was. I can sin, I can do something that's wrong, and I can continue like this. Because this sin is a reward for my sacrifice for the gospel. Now, that doesn't bear any logic, but that's what his argument was. I mean, in, in private, in, in, in the sin that he continued for such a long time. Now, I'm mentioning the name, and I'm speaking about this person as an example. Not because I want to put him down, but I'm just saying, look, this is reality. This is what's happened in the Christian world. So even though there is Bible truth that we know about, the devil is so deceptive 
to try and con convince us that tolerating sin is okay. But you and I must come to this place where say, sin will not be tolerated because sin will not have dominion over me. Sin will not have dominion over me. Now we may make mistakes, but you've got to get up and keep going. Okay, I'm going to pause here because uh, time is up. Um, we'll continue this on coming Monday. Uh, but you all with me so far? Okay. Let's uh, take a moment to pray and uh, we will dismiss. And I don't want to hold up because you do have to go for your next class. Uh, could somebody please... Um, just pray with us and then we will dismiss, please. Could somebody pray with us? Can I pray? Yeah. Go on. Go on. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you. We want to bless your name. We want to give you all the glory. We want to give you all the honor. We want to give you all the adoration. For the privilege of God to behold the wonders of your glory. Mm. Father, we thank you because we have not come here to complain of our many problems. And we have not come here, Lord, to show ourselves approved. Mm. We have not come here to prove that we are holy. Mm. But we have come here to recognize you know, your love you know, for us. Mm. The grace of God that you have bestowed upon our lives, that we are so glad and we rejoice in it. Mm. Father, we thank you, O oh God, for your son Jesus. And we thank you because you loved us even before, you know, we love you. Mm. Father, we thank you that the grace that you have given unto us, O oh God, will not elude us. Mm. We pray, Lord, that the, the words that we've heard today, O oh God, will abide in us that the devil will not see any room to deceive us of who we are in Christ. We thank you for your holiness. We thank you for your love. And we, we pray, Father, that you will continually remind us of who we are. Mm -hmm. Continually remind us that we are set free mm -hmm. and we're not held bound you know, by any sin. But rather, you know, we, we make mistakes and we, we come to know that you loved us. We pray, Father, that the words of God that we've heard this morning, this evening, this afternoon, mm -hmm. will not drop void. But, Father, O oh God Almighty, will be, O oh God, the word that will be a fruit in our lives. Mm -hmm. Blessed be your holy name. We thank you, O oh God, for your servant whom you've used to share this word of knowledge, word of wisdom, word of understanding. And we pray, Father, he shall not cease to continually share this word to all nations and tribes. In Jesus' much less name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Harrison. And thank you, each one, for joining the class. Have a good break and enjoy the rest of your day. See you again soon. Bye now. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. God bless. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you. God bless. Bye thank you, now. Pastor.